Is Broadcom a buy or a sell? Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 767 billion market cap. They're trading at 164 a share, and they have 4.7 billion shares outstanding. Broadcom designs and develops semiconductor devices with a focus on complex digital and mixed signal. It was founded in 1961, headquartered in Palo Alto, California. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Free cash flow looks amazing. It grows every single year from 13 billion to 19 billion. Margins are pretty good as well, 40% in the trailing 12 months. It was 49% for a while. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that more than doubled from six and a half billion to 14 billion. It did come down a lot in the trailing 12 months to five billion. Revenue is a sales for the company. And that also grows each year from 27 billion to 47 billion. Pretty impressive growth. They pay a dividend of 1.3%. It costs them $10 billion. So they can cover that dividend two times with their free cash flow. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 820 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $726 billion. We divide that by 4.7 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 156. They're trading at 164, so they're trading at a 6% premium. It's a sell according to the model. There are 64 companies in the same industry as Broadcom, and if they have a number in red, they're worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better. They don't spend much in CapEx, 500 million. That's less than the average. They're fabulous like NVIDIA, so they outsource their chips to companies like Taiwan Semi. They have the highest debt to equity ratio on this list. For every dollar of equity, $1.10 of debt. They pay a 1.3% dividend, which is between the median and average. They generate a lot of free cash flow. Third highest on this list at 19 billion. They're a really big company. They rank third in the semiconductor space. And they do seem overvalued according to their price multiples. They're trading at 11 times book value, 150 times earnings, 41 times free cash flow, and 16 times revenue. They generate a lot of revenue, 47 billion. And they're still growing. Their five year annual revenue growth rate is 16%. They're currently trading at 156, so a bit below their 52 week high much higher than their 52 week low of 90. If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $236,000 today. That's a 37% annual return. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 6% premium, ranking seven out of 10. I would definitely buy this stock short term seven out of 10, long term eight out of 10. Ratios are a bit weak, so that's three out of 10. Financials look great, eight out of 10. Let's look at the latest 10Q. Here's their income statement. The three months ending 7-30-23, the three months ending 8-4-24. Revenue 13 billion, up from 9 billion. Product revenue 7.4 billion. Subscriptions is up a ton, from 2 billion to 5.6 billion. Let's see if they give more detail on the revenue. Here's a further breakdown of the 13 billion of revenue. The 7.4 billion of products, only 580 million in the Americas, 6 billion in APAC, and 400 million in EMEA. That's interesting how little business they do in the US. Most of their US revenue is subscriptions, 3.4 billion, 600 million in APAC, 1.6 billion in EMEA. 57% of their revenue is in products, 43% in subscriptions. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. 2.4 billion or 19% is COGS, cost of products sold. Subscription expenses is only 700 million. And the revenue is 5.6 billion, so really good margins there. Amortization 1.5 billion, so total cost of revenue 4.7 billion. Gross profit 8.4 billion, that gives them a 64% margin. Last year it was higher at 69%. Then you have R&D 2.4 billion, these are the expenses to improve existing products or to come out with new products. Then you have SG&A. Those are all the expenses not directly tied to making the product or providing the service. Operating expenses, 4.6 billion. Operating income, 3.8 billion. So operating margin, 29%, down from 43%. Their taxes were 4.2 billion, which is higher than their operating income. So that gives them a loss of 1.4 billion. 
and their shares outstanding are going up from 4.1 billion to 4.7 billion. Let's look at their balance sheet. Current assets 20 billion, current liabilities 19 billion. So current ratio a little above one. They have 10 billion of cash, 4.7 billion of accounts receivables. This is how much money other companies owe them when they sell on credit. Inventory 1.9 billion. Here is a breakdown of their inventory. Finished goods 568 million, work and process 900 million, and raw materials 400 million. Their biggest asset is Goodwill 98 billion. So I guess they do a lot of acquisitions. 54 billion of that Goodwill is from the acquisition of VMware. This year Broadcom acquired VMware for 61 billion dollars. Before Broadcom, Dell owned VMware when Dell acquired EMC in 2016. VMware was part of EMC at the time. Total assets 168 billion up from 72 billion. Total liabilities 102 billion. 66 billion of long-term debt. Let's see if they give more info on that. Here's a breakdown of the long-term debt, the 66 billion. 600 million due this year at a 3.6% rate. Here's the effective interest rate. Effective interest rate takes new account compounding. The more compounding periods, the higher the effective rate relative to the nominal rate. The highest effective rate is close to 6%. That's also due this year. Some due in 2031. Look at that, a nominal rate of 2.2%, but effective 5 and 3 quarter percent. Assets minus liabilities equals equity, 66 billion of equity. They raised 67 billion from selling their business. They lost 1.9 billion from running their business. The reason they have accumulated deficit is probably because of all the stock buybacks. Let's look at a statement of cash flows. Their net income was 1.6 billion. I thought they had a net loss. Okay, here's their income statement. They did have positive 1.6 billion for the trailing nine months. They're doing the statement of cash flows on the trailing nine months, not the quarter end. It says three fiscal quarters. When I just glanced at it, I thought it was three months, but it's three quarters. So even though they only had 1.6 billion of net income, they actually generated 14 billion of cash flow. They had 7 billion of amortization. That's a non-cash item that brings down your net income, but we add it back here. 4.4 billion of stock-based compensation, triple last year, and 2.8 billion of deferred taxes. In their investing section, here's the acquisition for VMware. The statement of cash flows only tracks cash. So they spent 26 billion on the acquisition. The rest was stock. They received 3.5 billion from selling part of their business. Let's see if they give info on that. That 3.5 billion is a sale of EUC. EUC stands for end user computing. In July 2024, we sold the EUC business to KKR for 3.5 billion. KKR is a private equity firm. Enterprise value 700 billion, assets under management 553 billion. Let's go back to the statement of cash flows. They added 35 billion of debt. That's in the financing section. They paid back 12 billion of debt. They paid 7 billion of dividends. Last year, 5.7 billion. They bought back 7 billion of their own stock. Last year, 5.7 billion. And they bought back 4 billion of their employee stock. You see this 9.9 .9 billion on the statement of cash flows. That's also on the balance sheet. Right here, cash of 9.9 .9 billion. Let's look at a stock on Simply Wall Street. It's last price, 164, 760 billion market cap, flat in the past week, up 68% in the past year. The stock started trading in 2009 at a buck 66. So this is stock split adjusted. It's hard to tell in the first five or six years how the stock did. Looks like it did pretty well on a percentage basis. And it got up to 66 in January 2022. Then it got up to 66 in December 2021. Then over the next 18 months, it came down about 30-40%, then came back up to 66. Then from mid-2023 to current, the stock just blew up. It went from 66 to almost 200. Simply Wall Street's valuation is 160. They say the stock is 3% overvalued. 37 analysts priced this stock at 193. They say it's 18% undervalued. Their revenue back in 2014 was only 2.7 billion. And it looks like it pretty much only goes up. It hit 15 billion in 2017, 33 billion in 2022, and now it's closing in on 50 billion. It looks like they started paying a dividend in 2015. The yield got up to 5% in 2020. And as the stock price came up, the yield came down. 
It's down to a little over 1%. The forecast is 1.8% by 2027. In the past year, only insider selling, no buying. Wow, look at all those sales. About 1.2, 1.3 million insider shares have been sold in the past year. 78% of the companies owned by institutions, 21% by the general public, and 1% by insiders. The LA firm Capital Research is the biggest shareholder at 11%, then Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street. You have Wellington, Northern Trust, Jenison, Schwab, Eaton Vance, Goldman, and their employee count went up a lot from 8,400 to 20,000. The ticker trades on the London Stock Exchange, Deutsche Bursa, Mexican Bursa, Wiener Bursa, NASDAQ, Euro TLX, Zetra, Bats Europe, Lima Bursa, Santiago, Sao Paulo Bursa, Buenos Aires, the NEO, and the Stock Exchange of Thailand. If you want to know how to build the discounted cash flow model, how to understand the free cash flows, how to understand discounting, be a master at Excel and being able to predict stock prices for different companies, be the coolest kid in your school. Just watch this video, click on the top right corner of the screen, and I also send you a free Excel DCF model, but email me while supplies last.